This episode is brought to you by Shopify. That's the sound of another sale on Shopify. The moment a business dream becomes reality. Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. They simplify selling online and in person and provide 24-7 support so you can focus on successfully growing your business. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash offer 22, all lowercase. Today on CityCast Denver, this year marks the 50th anniversary of a landmark Supreme Court case that compelled Denver public schools to desegregate. But here we are a half century later, and DPS parents are faced right now with a choice that some people say is segregating our schools all over again. Today is Monday, February 13th, 2023. I'm Paul Caroli, and here's what Denver's talking about. Melanie Asmar, welcome back to CityCast Denver. Thanks for having me. So Melanie, you just took this really deep look at school integration for Chalkbeat. And locally, this story really starts with a person I think every Denverite should know, Rachel B. Noel. Can you tell me who was Rachel B. Noel? Definitely. She was Denver's first Black school board member. And she was elected in 1965, partly motivated by her children's experience in Denver public schools. There was some integration going on in the Park Hill neighborhood. Black families moving into Park Hill and the neighborhood was becoming um, more integrated, but the schools were staying segregated because of actions by the school board. And Rachel B. Knowles, her daughter, actually got transferred from Park Hill Elementary, which sort of had been semi-integrated to this brand new elementary school called Barrett Elementary, where 90-something percent of the students the first year we're going to be black. And, you know, she talked about how, you know, Barrett, even though it was a new school, didn't have as many resources. I think the teachers were not as experienced. And she said, you know, my daughter is learning the same thing at Barrett that she learned at Park Hill last year. So that's an obvious inequity right there. And it led Rachel B. Noel to run for the school board and eventually pass a measure that we now know as the Noel Resolution. What happened there? Yeah. So um, DPS had been studying integration and had passed some policy saying like, our school should be more integrated. We should take a proactive approach to doing this. And then nothing happened. It was like all talk and no action. So um, she introduced the Knoll Resolution um, shortly after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The impact of Dr. King never left me. And when he died... And we had a meeting on the uh, steps of the uh, city and county building. Somebody, and I wish I knew who it was, said that if you want to know what you can do to carry on Martin Luther King's work, if you believe in what he's doing, if you're in an elected position where you can make an impact, you can make an impact, now is the time to do it. And I thought, I am. And she said, I'm a decision maker. I'm on the school board. We're going to take this action. And so the Knoll Resolution was passed in uh, 1968. And it called for DPS, the superintendent, to come up with a plan to integrate Denver schools. It caused a big backlash. And the following year in 1969, there was a school board election. And several segregationist candidates won sort of, um, you know, using the null resolution and saying, you know, if you're opposed to integration and, and busing, you know, vote for us. And, and they were elected and they overturned several policies that the district was trying to put in place. And um, very shortly thereafter, eight families sued Denver Public Schools in what became known as um, the Keys lawsuit. One of the plaintiffs, a Black father named Wilfred Keys, was kind of the lead plaintiff. And so it's known as Keys versus school district number one. So the Keys case then goes all the way from one elementary school in Park Hill, Stedman Elementary, all the way up to the Supreme Court. Melanie, what was the impact of the Keys decision on DPS? The Supreme Court ruled 50 years ago this year that essentially because DPS was taking these... um, sort of proactive segregationist actions in the Park Hill neighborhood, 
that the entire district was de facto segregated, and they ordered DPS to desegregate its schools, quote, root and branch. And so the district did that through busing. And students were bused um, in the 70s, 80s, and into the 90s. And the goal that they were trying to achieve was that um, schools, I guess, racial demographics would kind of match the districts as a whole. Hmm. Did it work? Yes, on paper. There were a lot of other consequences of, uh, of the ruling. It caused massive white flight to um, the suburbs, to private schools. I remember coming across a report, I believe, from 1976. So this is just a couple of years after this 1973 court ruling that found that the white population of students in DPS had dropped 22% in just two years. And it continued. White families just left DPS. There was other backlash, other violence. The DPS bus depot was bombed. But, you know, individual students' experiences, the students that we've talked to over the years, um, who are now obviously adults, they, they recall their experiences very differently. Some people had really positive experiences and said, you know, it helped introduce me to students from all different backgrounds. I'm still friends with some of these people today. I'm very grateful for the sort of diverse education I got. But others will say, you know, there was a lot of racism. Some of them talked about like kids weren't allowed to come and sleep over at my house or parents wouldn't let me have play dates uh, with my classmates because they were different. At a lot of schools, the white students were in the honors classes and the black and Latino students were in uh, the traditional classes. And so even though the school as a whole, you know, looked integrated on paper, the classrooms inside of it were still segregated. Hey, Denver, it's Bree. You're listening to CityCast Denver right now, so you get it. This podcast reaches the Denverites who care most about what's going on in this city. Our listeners, you, are dedicated residents who live and breathe all things Denver. We know you're hungry for information and insights on new restaurants, local events, and ways to get involved. So if you run a local business, if you're fighting for a good cause, or if you're just throwing a big party and want Denverites to know about it, consider advertising on CityCast Denver. Get your message out to the city's best audience right now with an ad right here on the CityCast Denver podcast. Learn more at citycast.fm forward slash advertise or email us at ads at citycast.fm. I love thinking about this um, with the long view that you take in your piece, like this period of busing in the 70s and 80s and early 90s, it really did create the Denver we have today. I mean, so many of our leaders are DPS graduates. They went through this process. This is where they came from. But for better or for worse, busing ended in 1996 after a district court ruled that Denver had complied with the desegregation order. But now... 20, 25 years later, Denver schools have in many cases resegregated. How did that happen? That's right. Yeah. So um, Denver's neighborhoods are still very segregated. And so, you know, oftentimes neighborhood segregation leads to school segregation. Denver also has school choice, which means that families can apply, students can apply to attend any school in the district. And there's, you know, it, it, often if there's room, they'll get in. If there's, you know, more students than, than seats available, there's a lottery. But, you know, a past reporting I've done has found that even though a lot of um, Denver neighborhoods are gentrifying, again, there's integration in the neighborhood, but the schools are still remaining segregated. Like families will oftentimes move into a neighborhood, but then choice out of the neighborhood school for a school in a different part of town that they perceive as better. Hmm. Yeah. So this school choice thing is particularly important right now because we are in the end of this year's school choice period. And DPS families are submitting their choices for where to send their kids to school in the fall. I know this is a really hotly debated topic. There's activists out there. There's parents talking about this. What do critics say about the school choice process? Some folks believe that that if you buy a house in, in that neighborhood, you should go to the school down the block. Others believe that school choice isn't truly open to all because if you, you know, sort of choice out of your neighborhood school and you want to go to a school across town, the district does not provide transportation. 
So families are responsible for for getting their children to that other school. And, you know, if families don't have a car or there's not a bus route that goes there, like school choice isn't truly open to all, is what critics say, without the transportation piece. I want to talk about Stedman Elementary now, which you profiled in your piece. That's where the Keys case originated, and it's still bucking expectations like it did back in the 60s and early 70s. Melanie, what does Stedman Elementary look like today? Yeah, so Stedman is sort of a rare example of um, a DPS school that is um, very integrated. About a third of the students are Black, about a third are Latino, about a third are white. And uh, from the folks I talked to, there's sort of some mixed feelings about how Stedman got there. But the school is trying really hard to maintain that integration and that diversity. Yeah, let's talk about that. Tell me about that. What did you hear from administrators and parents about the work that it takes? Yeah, so Stedman um, is a school in in Park Hill, and it, it traditionally served a Black and Latino neighborhood. And um, several years ago, a principal who's no longer there brought in a Spanish language immersion program that hmm. attracted a lot of white families who, you know, were sort of attracted to the idea that their children could become bilingual. And I talked to a, a mother, a Black mother, who had been there um, before the Spanish immersion program. And she said at the time, it sort of felt to her like the school was kind of leaving Black families behind. It felt like there was a lot of questions um, from families about, you know, if my child is learning in Spanish, like I don't speak Spanish, how am I going to help them with their homework? And she said the white families were kind of all for it and said, like, we, the parents, will take private lessons so we can help our children. And she said Black families sort of felt left behind by that decision. And some of them ended up leaving Stedman for that reason and others. But many families stayed. The parents I spoke to at Stedman sort of fear that they'll lose the diversity the school currently has because there are so many white families who want to get into Stedman now for that Spanish immersion program. And one of the tools they have to do that is the school choice process. You can Schools can kind of prioritize which students they want to accept And oftentimes it's like at the top of the list are like children of teachers or um, siblings of students who already go there. Mm -hmm. The state constitution actually prevents schools from um, using race as like an admissions factor. Busing was an exception because of the Supreme Court order. So instead they use uh, family income. Um, Stedman, you know, prioritizes low income families, families who live in neighborhoods where most other families are low income trying to keep, you know, some of the socioeconomic diversity that the school currently has. Right. Yeah. Um, well, I have to tell you that the thing that stuck out to me about your story more than anything else was Principal Michael Atkins and the amount of work that he had to personally put in to do the outreach to maintain this level of diversity at this elementary school. We know DPS's budget isn't exactly bursting. That A lot of that labor is probably going uncompensated for. Do you think that it's possible right now to generalize what they're doing at Stedman across the district? Or is this just an impossibly difficult task to maintain diversity in our schools? Yeah, I think it's it's really difficult. Um, we know with with school choice, like it often means, you know, schools will often try uh, different things to attract families. Like, um, Enrollment in DPS is declining overall, and uh, you know the superintendent is is wanting to close some schools. The school board voted that down earlier this year, but that or last year that that conversation is likely to come back. But you you know you often see like small schools kind of trying to adopt programs that they hope will attract families, like an arts focus or a STEM focus. So I think a lot of schools do that. I think at at Stedman it was it was um, very successful. You know. I talked to a longtime parent there who remembers when there were like 230 kids in the school and now there's like 430. So it has, you know, it really worked in, in, in Stedman's case. Huh. That is so interesting to me how the effort to attract students can sometimes work against that push for diversity. Hmm. But Melanie, I mentioned that we are currently nearing the end of this school choice period. Families are making this difficult decision. Do you have any advice for parents who want the best for their kid, but maybe also want 
the best for their city? You know, the next generation of leaders of Denver? Yeah, I, I've done some stories, you know, kind of talking to experts, I guess, on on school choice and how to pick a school. And by experts, I mean, like parents and, and you know, principals. There are also, you know, some um, businesses that will kind of help you do this if you want to pay. Mm -hmm. But all of them kind of agreed, like, start with your neighborhood school, check it out first. You know, they recommend touring schools and, and you know, asking to to go and not just look at the cafeteria or the auditorium or like the shiny new playground, but actually like pop into classrooms and and see, you know, how the school like looks and feels. Ask questions. And they said, don't be afraid to ask the tough questions. Like if you've heard a rumor that there's a bullying problem, ask the principal because they probably actually really want to address that. And if it's not true, to clear up those rumors. And they've said, if you are trying to choice into a school that's not your neighborhood school, you will be responsible for getting your child there to, um, you know, drive that route yourself during rush hour and see how long it's going to take um, or, you know, take the public transportation and see how long it's actually going to take you to get there, see if it's feasible. But, you know, they all said kind of start with your neighborhood school, um, your your boundary school and, and go from there. Melanie Osmar, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. To hear more from Rachel B. Noel on the push for desegregation back in the 60s and 70s, we'll have a link in the show notes to the full clip we played earlier from the Higher Education Diversity Summit. And here's what else Denverites are talking about. Russell Wilson's charity work. The Broncos quarterback was a disappointment on the field this season after signing a blockbuster contract last summer, and now it sounds like his Why Not You Foundation has also been underperforming expectations. USA Today reports that less than half the money the foundation raised between 2014 and 2021 actually went to the causes it claims to support. After the USA Today report came out last week, the Why Not You Foundation released a statement defending their work, especially with the Seattle Children's Hospital. It includes a comment from the hospital applauding Wilson and his wife Sierra for attracting more than $10 million in donations and being, quote, compassionate visitors to our patients and families. And here's some good news for transit riders. Nine News reports that RTD is deliberating over a proposal to reduce fares. It would reduce the price of a three-hour pass from $3 to $2.75 and the price of a ride to DIA from $10.50 to a flat $10. If RTD's board approves the proposal, riders could see the reductions implemented as early as next year. And finally, CityCast is hiring! We're growing and we're looking for a senior account executive to join our revenue team and work directly with me and CityCast Denver to kick our ad sales into high gear. So if you're an ad selling whiz based here in Denver and you're looking for a new challenge, check out the job listing in our show notes. That's all for today here on CityCast Denver. If you enjoyed the show, why not take a minute to tell the DPS parent in your life about us? Rate the show wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to our morning newsletter, Hey Denver, by texting Denver to 66866. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. See ya. I'll slow down.